to Script Camp. This is a free class on how to pitch and communicate a movie idea um, because so much of what we do is dependent on how we communicate our ideas and how we explain and express what uh, the journey of a movie will be in a pretty short time frame. So we're going to be looking at about two to three minutes in order to um, take us through the main points of the story. You don't have to take us all the way through to the end, though, if your pitch is going really well and you're doing, if you're doing great on time then you can theoretically take us through to the end if it doesn't push you way over the limit. But we're going to give you just the warning, the wave warning at three minutes, and then if it goes much beyond that, we're going to have to cut you off. Um, so make sure to t time yourself and practice these out beforehand if you want to make sure you're getting the best possible um, version of this um, out there and to get the best possible feedback. So by just putting in that extra, you know, the 15, 20 minutes of practicing a pitch, you can get it to that next level and make sure that you're keeping the audience's attention, drawing them into the world, and just effectively informing them what happens in this story in such a way that if they were in a position where they could buy that idea or they could ask to read that whole idea or maybe they just want to know what other scripts that you have, they would be interested enough to do so and they would feel as if they are in good enough hands that they would feel good about asking for more from you. So. That's all to say that screenwriting is a super, super social form of writing. It's not all just going to be sitting at home secluded in your dark attic by yourself. Um, so much of this comes down to how do we just explain what an idea is in a way that makes it sound exciting and interesting, and we can show people that we can really get to the point, and it's not going to be like, you know, your great aunt Velma at Thanksgiving who just goes on and on and on and includes all the unimportant details. We're going to show that we can actually cut right to the point, that we know what's important in our stories, and we're going to demonstrate a level of mastery and control over the narrative. Okay, let's get going. So, um, before we get started, our purpose today is just to have fun, to help you refine your idea, and to practice and improve at your pitching technique. We're not actually going to buy your movie idea today. This is just to help you build those skills and learn the techniques that you're going to need as somebody who wants to work either in professional Hollywood uh, screenwriting of feature films or of TV shows. So much pitching that you have to do in TV, especially if you're in a writer's room. You have to always be sort of pitching and throwing ideas around and modifying them based on other people's feedback and riffing, and you just need to get really good at verbally expressing what a narrative story idea is, or you know, articulating the beats of a narrative story. Be prepared to hear that certain parts of your idea are not quite working super well. If an idea was already perfect, there'd be no need to bring it to a workshop, as we know. But we're looking generally for original, clear, and high concept pitches that are going to bloom in the mind to suggest a whole compelling movie. So you take us, generally, you, you will um, start us off with just the title and genre, which are the most important, just first things to read. And it's going to come with comps, too. Comps being two other movies that you will compare yours to, or two other TV shows, which might clarify the tone or otherwise your intentions behind the project. Um, the next thing is the logline. So this might be just like, you know, one sentence that expresses what this movie is about. It might be in the form of something like, you know, when inciting incident, an adjective protagonist must conflict before stakes. It doesn't have to be exactly that, but it's a one sentence expression of the movie's idea. So once you give us those, so I would, if you're going to be pitching today and you want feedback on your pitch, have your worksheet open or your sketchbook open. Oops, wrong one. There we are. Have your work worksheet or sketchbook open and be writing some of these things out and getting ready to copy paste them into the chat. Once we've talked some more first and once we've gone over some more lecture things, don't don't paste it right away or else we're going to kind of lose track of it and you'll have to do it again. But be working on at least the basics if you want. And even if this is just some newer idea that you have a pitch for but you haven't written everything out perfectly, that's all okay. But at least have the title and genre and the log line and comps written out that you can copy paste into our chat that we can bring up um, in a little bit when we're ready to move on to that portion. So um, you are, don't actually have to have the full pitch written out. Um, and if you're going to just kind of um, riff and, and do your best on a newer idea, that is OK. Um, but just understand where you'll still have the same limit as if um, it, you know, all, all pitches will have the same limit of around, you know, right at the three minutes, you'll get the warning. And then if you go on, uh, uh, let's say, another 30 seconds, then we're going to have to let the, the let you get the cutoff. But that's the general guidelines there, so be at least ready to provide us these written things. The rest of it you can express verbally because, again, so much of what we're doing is verbally expressing stories in Hollywood. Like, you wouldn't think that this was a huge part of it, but pitching and being good in a room is all about being able to verbally and clearly articulate the story out loud. Um, it's a public speaking skill, so screenwriting is weird because it's like nine different jobs in one. You have to be a marketer, a promoter of your own work. You have to be 
a, uh, a fantastic, you know, story structure analyst who can just realize why ideas aren't fitting together and, and reassemble them in a way that does work. And the biggest thing is that you have to be very social and good to work with and kind and cooperative and just a very clear speaker. So you can practice all these things. I mean, take a public speaking class or a theater class or an improv class if, if these are things that you do struggle with. But these workshops like this are intended to help you just kind of work on those skills and build those calluses in such a way that you won't freeze up or get too nervous when it comes to actually expressing an idea. And you're going to have done this before. You're going to have practiced this, and you're going to know what to watch out for. So the page itself, um, remember, give us title, genre, logline first, then just wait for a second as I read that back. I usually have to read the logline again in order to fully make sure I understand and ask just a couple clarifying questions right off the bat. Once, Once those clarifying, clarifying questions are done, we'll say, okay, we're ready for the pitch. Go ahead. And you'll have, you know, two to three minutes of, you know, 3.30 being that hard cutoff to take us through the story and focus focus really clearly on that central journey of the main character. Try not to get distracted with too many subplots. Don't spend half your pitch on the opening scene. Um, don't get too hung up on setup at the very beginning. You need to just get us into the movie. Within the first couple sentences, we should be moving from our, you know, first act into our catalyst into our... Um, are breaking the two by like four or five sentences usually is how long that's going to take. Um, it's not a hard rule, but just keep in mind we got to get to the point pretty fast, faster than you probably think. Um, and then you'll take us to about the midpoint, and then from there you want to suggest the trajectory of the rest of the narrative and say, and then they have to overcome this and this on their way to doing that, and that's the rest of the movie. That's like what you'll, how you'll kind of summarize the rest of the movie. Unless you're doing great on time. If you're doing great on time and you're not even to, you know, 2.30 yet, then you have plenty of time left. You can go ahead and take us through to the end if you want. Um, but basically think of this as like a, it's like a verbal trailer. And you're trying to sort of summarize and take us through the, the greatest hits, the, the coolest bullet points of the story in a really truncated and concise way to make sure that the audience is not missing any of the key twists, but not getting too bogged down in the minutia or the, the geometry of like, and then they have to get to this place, but they take, but they, they don't take a bus, they take a train. Wait, no, they don't take a train, they take a blimp. Like don't get too hung up on how we logistically get from one scene to the next. Like in the, in the pitch mode, we can sort of fill in a lot of gaps. So you can do, feel very free to kind of abridge and truncate and summarize a lot of story information. Um, okay, so yeah, and stick to that Stick to that main character. Try not to give us a full picture of every single subplot or else we'll probably just get lost. Um, during class, you can use the chat channel for the classroom. Just mouse over the voice channel that says classroom and you'll find a small white word bubble that says open chats. Um, and you can use that to leave your text comments and questions and also you can use that to post your log lines when we get to that part of the class. Joel has a question, will there be a TV version of this or will it be covered in this lesson? So I'm mostly focusing on features today. Um, we have done a bit of TV pitching in the um, our TV bootcamp classes before, um, but it's a bit different in the, how you approach those because a feature story is one complete story, whereas a show is more focused on sort of the engine that will keep that show going throughout many, many years. So yeah, later we, we might do just a more TV focused version, or we have in the past and we might do more, I should say. TV focused versions of this class. You you can pitch a TV show today, but the 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 slides and the information and the lecture portion I'll be doing is going to be focusing on features. So maybe you can sort of apply this to your pilot if you, if you want to. Um, but TV pitches, yeah, much more focused on fascinating character, interesting world that 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 character lives in, and sort of highlighting and emphasizing what is going to keep the engine of that show burning for years and years of episodes. So that's less important in a feature as is the character journey. So we're focusing on journey over engine in feature pitches, I would say. Uh, good question though. Any other questions so far before I go more into how to, do, how to do this and what to focus on, what makes a good pitch? You can feel free to either type or you can unmute and speak out loud. If you're watching on one of our other channels like YouTube or Twitch or Twitter or Facebook, you can leave your comments there too. And it takes me a minute to see them sometimes, but we should be able to see them as well. But we'd encourage you could, to join us on Discord. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but could we like still pitch TV shows like today or is it something that not really? No, you can. I'm just uh, the 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 lecture slides and the, the the advice and guidance I'll be giving will be more focused on features. 
Um, so if you, if you really have a show that you'd like to get into, you, you totally can. But just remember to emphasize, how, why is this a show? Why is this going to last for years of episodes? How, how, is this going to, like, how is this going to be a story that requires many, many episodes to tell? Just keep that really in the front of your mind. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Uh, I was going to ask um, how one might pitch uh, like a, a limited series or, or something akin to that. Where it's oh, like, yeah, you know I was just going to ask that. You're like playing like a finite job. amount of episodes. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be similar to, more, more similar, similar to, to a TV, TV show, show than a feature, at least in my experience. Because um, like, like, it still has a pilot, and a limited, limited series, series could still be, you know, 8, 10, 12 episodes long. There's no real rules, I don't think, on how many episodes they could be. Um, but I think, and, and I've never actually pitched a limited series before, so you probably want to ask somebody who knows this a little better than me, but just if I had to give an answer right off the bat, I would say probably to approach it a bit more like a TV pitch. Like, we want to really focus on that pilot, which is the first, like, you know, hour and a half to potentially up to an hour and a half if this is a longer sort of miniseries or something like that. So really take us through the journey of that one, and then you want to sort of suggest the trajectory of the rest of the show. I don't think you would want to probably take us through the entire series in just this shortened version of a pitch, unless, for instance, you had multiple meetings about it already, and the, the producers you're meeting with are like, okay, take us through the whole thing. I think there would be a, that would be like several rounds of pitches down the line. For the very first one, you probably want to just focus on that first episode, that quote pilot, so to speak, and then sort of tell us where it's going and like sort of suggest the arc of the rest of it rather than trying to take us through every single episode. Oh wow, Siri thought I was talking to her. No, Siri. Um, I hope that answers that question. I, I feel like it didn't that well, so we should probably ask somebody who has pitched limited series and, and mini series in the past. Um, and uh, they're, it, it's sort of its own beast in some ways. Um, I'm not exactly sure how how if, if if companies are like necessarily production companies are taking pitches on limited series as much um i'm not quite sure the specifics of those so definitely ask somebody that knows a little better but for now i say probably approach it more like a tv pitch other questions All right, so if there's no more questions, let's go into a little bit of info and um, uh, we'll look at just the basics of Script Camp for those who don't know. Um, so Script Camp, we are a screenwriting community focused on taking you from concept to idea to first draft to more polished script with lots of free classes like this one, events and workshops. We have over 100 hours a month of different events. Some of these are for um, the public, you know, free and public classes like this one. Some of these are going to be boot camps, writers labs, and advanced labs, which are our classes for the supporting members of the server. So here's just a little about me. I have been a pro writer in Hollywood since 2017, when I got signed for the first time, and I've been signed and working since then. I have a thriller script set up at a production company in town, and I teach at the boot camps and weekly writers lab, mostly writing horror and thriller and action features. Um, we are a part of Skill Camp, which is the larger umbrella that includes many other servers like Film Camp, Creator Camp, Toon Camp, Word Camp, Design Camp, and Code Camp that have many different types of classes. We are a nonprofit organization with free and low-cost classes to help you learn skills and reach your life goals. With new classes coming soon, free uh, and for supporting members, so drop by our new servers and say hi. We have a bunch of classes going on now, such as the Coding Boot Camp series Sundays at 1 p.m., over on Code Camp, learn about programming languages no matter what your experience level is. We have animation classes Tuesdays at 3 p.m. on Toon Camp. That's our animation focus server. We have new novel classes. A bunch of them just got announced or are getting announced very soon. Uh, new fiction writing classes will be Saturdays at noon um, for the next month with a new novel boot camp, writing a whole book in 12 weeks starting on February 11th. Meanwhile, we have pilot boot camp Fridays at 6. We have Feature Boot Camp Sundays, 11 to 1, and coming soon will be new script analysis classes, which should be meeting probably Thursdays on Script Camp in February. So we have plenty of weekly classes. A bunch of these are free, um, and some of these, it's only really the, the boot camps and the labs, and access to the video library that you're going to need to sign up for membership to get. We have plenty of free clubs and events per week as well, such as Fantasy Workshop, Horror Workshop, 
Um, we have two script swaps per week, sketch comedy workshop, writer's lab, and advanced lab. There's just so much to do on all of our different events and workshops, so we hope to see you in some of these coming up. And make sure to just go to scriptcamp.net to find the full calendar of all of our upcoming classes and workshops. Here's a bunch of the new ones coming up. So we have best protagonist of the story. That's going to be day after tomorrow, Friday, January 20th at 11 a.m. We're going to look at how to match the right main character for the right story. It's going to be a free public to our class. We have a bunch of other free classes coming out, such as subplots in movies and TV shows, which I've never done a full class on before, but have been definitely meaning to. That'll be next Wednesday, the 25th of uh, January at 6 p.m. We then have the intro to our upcoming uh, feature course. The new one will be Friday, February 17th at 6. And we have the intro to the new TV course, March 5th at 11 a.m. Plus a ton of novel writing classes coming out. First page of your novel, writing, action, and adventure. Queer later class, uh, we have a guest QA class with a developmental editor named Max Higgins on Saturday the 11th at noon. We have how to outline a novel, and then finally we have that new beginning of our new novel boot camp that's going to be February 18th at noon. Those are all on WordCamp, so that's a separate server. Definitely come and join that one if you're interested in writing books, short stories, fiction, or nonfiction. You can donate and become a supporting member, get access to all of our boot camps and labs from just $29 a month with our yearly discount. You can volunteer if you know a language or skill you'd like to teach. You can contact me or Nacho, and you can always contact your friends. If you refer somebody, you and they will both get a free month of Unlimited plus a free month of ArcStudio Pro, which is a great screenwriting software. Okay, uh, let's talk pitching tips. Um, I will do an example, and then and I would expect in about... 20, 25 minutes to be posting your log lines and getting ready to read out those basics. Remember, the way that we'll do it is you'll post your log line, the titles, and the uh, genres in the chat, and I will we'll wait till a couple of those are posted. I'll pick one, call on one, and then you will just read them, out, read those basics out for us. I'll ask clarifying questions, and then I will say, go ahead, go ahead into the into the pitch. You'll have you know three minutes to do the whole thing. So um, be, remember, be typing up your just those essential basic facts about your story so you can get ready to copy and paste it when the time comes very soon. Um, let's look at some tips first uh, before we go into my example for today. Last time we did a pitching class, I pitched all of How to Train Your Dragon, which was actually really fun, sort of condensing that story into two and a half minutes. Um, really allows you to just focus on the, the bare essentials of the journey, just this, the, if we zoom in laser focus onto the protagonist's journey, it doesn't really allow you to build out every side relationship, but you just kind of get from point to point, you cut all the fat away, and it was a lot of fun doing that. So this time I'll be doing a different genre, different type of movie entirely. This time I will be doing a full pitch for The Ring uh, by uh, Aaron Kruger and Scott Frank from 2003. Um, let's do a couple tips before I get to that one. So first thing is we need to really organize the pitch to hold the listener's interest and attention, which means that your story should kind of be blossoming from the most fundamental expression to those more granular details, meaning that we have to kind of have different sizes of the pitch, meaning at one end you have to be able to just sort of say, oh, it's a buddy cop movie in space. And that's just the smallest possible expression of what this is because it's kind of saying, well, it's this meets that. And that's what comps are really good for. And that's why if one of your comps is just some tweak of the style or some twist of the approach, like, for instance, Buddy Cops in Space, or we could say, I don't know, it's a rom-com, but that takes place in reverse chronological order. Or, you know, if you have some just basic thing like that where it's uh, providing a clear variation on something that we already understand, it's good, it's good to lead with that. So when you're first, somebody's like, what have you got for me? It's best to start with, I've got a rom-com set in outer space. And they're like, I'm in. If you just have the smallest box version, be something that immediately grabs our attention. Because if you just start off with like, oh, well, I don't know, it's another rom-com, then no one's going to be excited. Um, you have to kind of tell us that this is going to be in the realm of something we expect or that we're interested in or that we want to hear, that we want to see. Because you have to imagine that people who are producers or, or you know, um, people who are acquiring scripts for contests or who for to writers that they might want to rep or anything like this they have a, a a narrow scope in terms of the genre and the type of projects that they'll want to take on i know that everyone's like we just want good stuff we'll take anything good but really people have areas of interest and they have certain genres that they will probably focus on 
So, for instance, if you're pitching to someone who is making horror movies, they're not going to take pitches for romance movies, almost certainly. Um, and if you're, you know, it, you just have to kind of direct your pitches and think of them very carefully like that. And if you are in the right audience, then just having something like it's a rom-com set in space might be very en enough to get that person to lean in and be open and receptive to hearing the rest of your story. If they're like, I'm, I've heard a million rom-com pitches today, but I haven't heard anything that has grabbed my attention and blown my mind, then you might, ha by having that really kind of concise version of the script, the smallest possible box, then uh, it is a really easy way to get someone to engage right off the bat and to start to build the confidence that you want to establish and maintain throughout the entire pitching time that you have. <coughs> Give me a sec. Okay. Um, so, instead of diving right in and presenting every aspect of the story, it's best to start with, it's this meets that, it's this in space, it's die hard on a blimp, it's whatever it is, um, as you're just kind of like the very first things that you lead us with. Um, if you don't have some incredibly simple way of boiling it down like that, it could be that your idea just isn't really simple enough, perhaps, or it might be that you just have the rare kind of story that there's no, absolutely no way you can boil it down to that. In which case, you kind of got to just pick something. Find some just concise way of, in just a few words, expressing what the movie is. <clears throat> um, beyond that, you should kind of lead us with comps or a brief explanation of the tone, if that's helpful for us understanding what it is. If you say something like, you know, it's a pulp adventure movie with a tone like The Mummy, that's going to be very different than if you're writing, you know, a really serious, dramatic war film. It's telling us that the content is going to be different, the approach is going to be different, and that the stuff, you know, just the, the way that that experience feels will be radically different. So very helpful to lead us off with something that will just help us understand the movie, because if you start us off by saying, okay, it's a, you know, if we start off thinking it's going to be a serious, scary horror movie, and it turns out it's about, I don't know, a killer cricket or something like that, then we might be like, that's kind of wacky, not very scary. And then it, will, might, it might throw off your audience's expectations um, right at the beginning, which is not what we want to do. So definitely clarify, oh, this is going to be a wacky horror movie, like Tremors at the beginning, if that's indeed what it's going to be, and if that will help us to picture the right thing. And the longer that we spend picturing the wrong thing, the more interest you'll tend to, to lose. Um, we can make sure that we're laying out the story's walls um, very carefully. So in terms of a time frame or boundaries or a ticking clock, these are really useful things to include, especially pretty early, like as early as they make sense to, to go in a script or in a pitch, because it means that it sort of helps us picture the entire thing. It doesn't make it just feel like this is going to be an endless series of episodic incidents. Um, it helps us if we know the time frame and if we know those kind of walls and boundaries, especially for something contained like a thriller, like a lot of thrillers um, really benefit from having some, some sense of propulsive ticking clock to the proceedings, um, then it is, uh, those just help us picture the movie and help us see it in our minds um, more clearly than others. If it's gonna be something like, excuse me, if it's gonna be something like, this is a sweeping epic drama that takes place over the course of five generations, then it's still helpful to know that pretty early on so that we can expect these drastic shifts in, in time in, in your narrative. Um, we don't really need to know any background or context that doesn't really help us, though. Like, anything that isn't super essential, anything like how you thought of the idea, if it's not particularly relevant. I mean, if you are a nuclear engineer and you got this great idea while you were staying late in the silo one day or something like that, maybe that would be kind of interesting or relevant or explain why you're the person to tell the story. But if it's not anything super special, it probably doesn't really matter that you thought of this while you were riding a bike with your dad or whatever it is. So don't, don't lead us down a path if you're not actually going to take us somewhere interesting. Um, and last, you don't really need to use character names. Um, it's okay to use one or two, um, but we're not going to remember more than one or two names um, in a pitch for the most part, so don't expect us to. And if you end up using more than one or two, then you may have to remind us who you mean when you get to that person again. And unless your main character is somebody famous or some public domain character, like, I don't know, um, you know Dorian Gray or uh, Harriet Tubman, then in which case you would say, Oh, you might call them out by name so that we understand what we're watching, or you, we might get the fact that it's a biopic about that person's life. A couple other things. Um, really focus on the main character. The only characters we probably really need to get too much into are going to be the protagonist, the antagonist, and the central relationship. Beyond them, you generally don't need to mention anyone by name. Now and again, it comes up, and it's, it's okay, but don't, try not to 
feel like you have to build out this really comprehensive picture of every subplot. Definitely ask yourself if this is... You, I would think that these are your own original movies. I'm going to be pitching a movie that already exists just for the purposes of demonstration, but you should be pitching generally your own movies. Um, you want to imply that internal journey that will intertwine with the external one. So if, if it's unclear why this person is the one that needs to go on this journey, then it may be that your character has not been matched well enough to your story, in which case you should check out the Friday class at 11 a.m., which is going to be looking at just this, which is how to pick the right character to go through that series of events and to make sure that we're using the best, we're making the best use of the story space that we have put that character in. Um, motivation and urgency should be pretty clear as well from a uh, pitch. Like it, we, if it takes an extra sentence for us to understand why your main character has to act and why it's so important and urgent that they do, and that they do act now, and that there will be consequences of some kind in the sense of stakes that matter for that person, like relative to things that matter for them, high stakes is what we're generally looking for. We're looking for movies that are about important decisions and big journeys, and often a movie is going to be about the most important events of that character's life thus far um there are exceptions to that now and again and and a lot of the time it's sort of we're sort of saying the movie is a character's sort of origin story that they have go on to have way more adventures after this story is done um and that's okay but just for the purposes of this like you should understand that it needs to feel like it's important generally movies don't benefit from feeling like they're we're, that we're watching something trivial or everyday or something that doesn't matter we want to make it feel like the story matters and that the world has altered in some way by the end of it whether that means the world itself or maybe just the relationships of the characters or something that they realize about themselves or otherwise we just kind of have a clear character journey there that demonstrates that something has altered that there was a point to all of this and that we from having watched this will have come to understand something perhaps about human nature or life or the world or, or something it doesn't have to be some incredibly profound statement about the life of the universe but it should be clear that there was some sort of thematic journey that was present here even if you weren't able to sort of really clarify every single step of it uh, okay, so uh, I think I have one more slide of um, advice for this, and then I might go right into my example. So a co couple common problems. I've gone over a few of these before, so I won't spend way too long on these. But if it's just kind of an idea for an idea, that means you don't quite even have enough for pitching at the moment. If it's just somebody should make a movie about this, um, then it's like, well, yeah, you should do that. You should tell us what it is, because we can't really rely on the audience to fill in all those blanks for us. You have to be able to take us through two to three minutes of actual content for the story where we can see the character moving and encountering obstacles and overcoming these obstacles and it feels like it's going to create the kind of genre thrills that you have indeed promised in the first place um it may not be a problem or it may it may be a problem i should say if you have no clear hook where the story just sort of sounds down the middle where and we see this i call this um uh, shark, shark problem, problem sometimes, sometimes in, in, in lines, lines or something like that. that. I don't know if I've ever actually called that before, but this is something you see sometimes where it's like, when she's attacked by a shark, a woman who hates sharks must survive the shark attack or else be killed by the shark. And it's like, yeah, that's what that, that's what that would be. Um, and everything is technically in place there, but what's the hook? We've seen person needs to fight a shark movies before, just like we've seen a million detective movies before, just like we've seen a million fantasy movies before. We've seen a lot of every genre before, and if it sounds like you're just describing a type of situation or you're describing the genre itself, then it could be that you aren't either that your story doesn't have a clear enough hook, or it could be that you aren't um, putting that hook clearly enough at the center of your pitch. And that, that it isn't, isn't clear, like, like how, how your character is going to solve this problem. How is what, what unique tactic or limitation does your character have? Um, not just as Die Hard with Sharks. Yeah, yeah we, we can do that, that. sure. Um, what if we did, yeah, let's, let's do Die, die Hard with Sharks. So now, not only is this lady, you know, stranded on an oil, oil platform, platform surrounded by sharks, by sharks. She's, she's got, got a bunch of guns, and she's got to take them out one at a time, sort of tricking them and pitting them against each other. I don't know, who knows, maybe there's something there. You, you, gotta you gotta just find, find something, something to make your sort of sound like it stands out, out and like it, it's, it's gonna, gonna be something, something we haven't seen that exact movie before. before. If, if it, it if it, it turns out that in the pitch it actually is this incredibly layered and detailed and intriguing story, then it, it may just be that that your expression of the pitch isn't bringing out the hook. It may be that you don't know what the hook of your story is. And that, and that is a problem, problem that we do see sometimes, especially with drama writers, who drama writers sometimes are just like, I don't know, people clash and collide and it's complicated. And we're like, no, you have a clear hook here. You just need to find a way to 
emphasize it and communicate it in a way that would get someone who buys pitches to be interested in buying it or reading the rest. Um, okay, so what else have I got? Uh, Shall, Shall we just, just go, go into, into this pitch for the ring? I think we probably should. Um, and I'm going to time myself just to make sure I don't go way over. And I'm going to make sure that I'm trying to cap out around three minutes. I might go just very slightly over, but 3.30 is going to be that final call, um, the final cutoff. So if we remember from, uh, from last time when I did how to, how to Train Your Dragon, this is something that I didn't write this movie, of course, so I'm going to be pitching someone else's story. <coughs> And, and for your, your own, own, since, since you, you are in full control of it, you should be aware of, of or you should at least try your very best to be aware of the things that don't matter or that you can cut out and still get the gist of what happens in the time frame. So you're not going to be able to include every single scene or every subplot or every character. You kind of have to cut a lot of this away and emphasize just the, the most important moments. And that's what so much of screenwriting is going to be, especially in this pre-writing stage, stage where we have to be delivering, you know, a full summary of the story info, info but, but we have a limited time to do it. it. It's, it's all going to come down to excision of stuff that doesn't belong and stuff that, belong and stuff that isn't helping you. you. Okay, okay. So, so suffice to say, I'm going to thoroughly spoil the plot of The Ring uh, from 2002. One of, one of my absolute favorite movies, movies and one of the best movies ever written. written. <coughs> In my, my opinion, opinion um, it is absolutely great. great. So, I have written down um, some bullet points. I don't want you guys to be looking at them just because I guess I don't want you to be too distracted by them. Um, I can show you guys after what I uh, wrote down just to have the, the basics. Um, I'll at least post the, oh, I have a log on the slide, we're good. So um, I'm gonna try not to be reading directly off of them. I'm just going to use them as kind of a reference point or like cards that I can come back to. It's like when you're giving a speech and you have the notes written on your hand or, or whatever. So we don't wanna be too robotic, but we also don't wanna to be too sort of loosey goosey. You wanna to try to find a nice in-between point in terms of your delivery. You wanna slow down and make sure you're getting everything out there and we're not missing any important stuff. I know that I tend to start talking too fast in classes and I have to force myself actually to slow down to about this pace in a pitch for everything to really come through. And I have to refer back to that, you know, the years of the theater class notes, so every class the teacher says, you gotta slow down, you gotta slow down. So make sure that you're getting all the info out and you're not stumbling over yourself, you're not getting all tripped up and you're just able to tell the story in a very natural way. Okay, I'm probably just gonna go right into this. Um, um, unless, unless we have, we have any, any, do we have any questions, questions before, before I, uh, uh, go into the ring? No questions. Okay. okay. Um, um, I'm, I'm just, just going, going to go, go into, into this story here then, and I'm, I'm going, going to put, put my clock on and we'll start right now. Okay. okay. So. Rachel is a workaholic Seattle journalist who's always just a little too busy for her precocious oddball son named Aiden. When her niece dies in what's considered a strange overdose, Rachel's sister calls her to the funeral and asks her to look into the rumored cause behind the death, because people are saying that the girl was killed by a cursed videotape. Her death is the last in a series of several of her friends who suffered the same fate, all of them one week to the day after watching the same tape. So, so Rachel, Rachel, who desperately, desperately needs a story to jumpstart her faltering career, begins, begins her investigation at the mountain retreat where her niece and her friends first watched the tape, which is called Shelter Mountain Inn. She, she rents the same cabin and finds, finds a copy of the tape there, which is an unmarked VHS tape that contains strange and bizarre, frightening, surreal imagery. After the tape ends, she receives a mysterious phone call from a little girl who warns her that she has seven days to live. So, with the help of her ex uh, husband, a husband, a video, video analyst named Noah, Rachel, Rachel makes, makes him a copy and he watches the tape too and they both start investigating its origins. So as the days tick by, Rachel begins to see images from the tape that appear in the real world and they seem to be omens of her approaching death, but also she can use them as a breadcrumb trail of clues in order to track down the tape's origins. And in her research, she identifies a woman on the tape as a horse breeder named Anna Morgan who killed herself after her horses drowned off her the Pacific Northwest Island where she lived. Just as she discovers this, the stakes ratchet sky high as she finds her son watching the tape, meaning that if Rachel doesn't stop the curse, her son Aiden will be the next to die after her. So, Rachel goes to Anna Morgan's home and discovers that Anna adopted a daughter named Samara. It turns out that Samara had the ability to psychically etch images onto objects and into people's minds that would radiate out of her at all times. 
and the girl's parents killed her to make the psychic torment stop. Rachel discovers the isolated bedroom where Samara was kept by her parents so they wouldn't have to deal with her, and she finds the psychic image of a tree, the tree at the lodge, burned into the wallpaper, which seems to be pointing her back to where it all started, at Shelter Mountain Inn. So Rachel and Ella return to the cabin, they rip up the floorboards, and they find the well from the videotape. That a, con a concealed well built into the ground that the, sh the cabin has been built over top of to hide. So they remove the lid, and a supernatural force pushes Rachel inside. While she, when she falls down into the well, the corpse grabs her, and Rachel has a vision which confirms her hunch that Anna Morgan, the girl's mom, murdered her, pushed her down there, and she survived for seven days. And her sort of unchecked psychic power radiated out of her body and burnt its way onto the VHS tapes in the cabins. So, so now that, that Samara it seems that her spirit has been set free, Rachel is rescued from the cabin, and, and she arranges a proper funeral for Samara, telling her husband Noah, I guess, you know, seven days have passed, so it seems like we're all safe. Okay, okay. oh, I've got ten seconds left on the clock. I'm going to wrap it up. So Rachel seems to have mended her faltering relationship with her son throughout this ordeal, but he warns her that she's actually made a mistake helping Samara. He's been experiencing some kind of psychic connection with the ghost girl this whole time, and he warns Rachel that Samara is going to take Noah next. And he's right, the vengeful ghost of Samara crawls through his TV screen and murders him. So Rachel finds his disfigured body and returns home, smashes the tape. She doesn't understand why was she spared. She and Aiden realize that she's the only one among them who made a copy of the tape. So Samara, the girl, the ghost girl who just wanted to be heard, she will spare those who help spread the tape far and wide. So, so Rachel, Rachel shows Aiden how to make a copy of the tape himself to show to someone else, which saves him from Samara's curse, and, and the, the last frames of the movie sort of show them spreading it to us, like we are the ones who have watched the tape next, and now we're sort of going to die in seven days. The end. Yeah. <laughs> I think I ran 10 or 15 seconds over the, the final cutoff. That's okay. Um, okay. That's the, uh, that's the whole story. So I, did, I took it all the way through to the end. If, if you were running your pitch and you only got to uh, and you realize you're sort of running out of time you, can, you don't have to go all the way through to the end so for this i could have stopped at the point where it's like and once aiden watches the tape now she has to um you know uh rush to solve those last clues to find a way to release this ghost girl spirit before she kills them all i could have left it there and you can totally do that that's fine but if you have the time you go ahead and, and try to take us through to the end if you think that you can pull it in uh in a reasonable rate <laughs> okay um so uh, that's, that's the ring. Right. Um, um, I want to just take questions on anything that we're doing today before we start to post those log lines and getting ready to answer those questions about them and moving into the pitching portion where you guys will do exactly what I just did. Is that a hand raised emoji or is that just a clapping hand emoji? It's just, oh my gosh, they're flying all over the screen. Everybody understand exactly what we're doing? Oh wait, I have a question. So mm -hmm. like, let's say like, it's a really detailed story, but it's like at the same time, you're pitching it and pitching it, but you realize, it's not that you're going towards the end, it's like, what if you're pitching the story, but you have like an extra minute left, but you're sort of done already pitching it. Oh. Could you like <laughs> go into other details as well? I would. Or like, I, I, if you, you get, you would. If you get to the end, it it becomes very difficult to say. Oh, also, let me go back fill some extra details now that I reached the end. You know what I mean? Like I think that means it's a sign that you should probably just prepare the pitch a little differently for the next time. And the fact that you have that extra room there means that you can take a little more time with the stuff in the middle. Like if I were to take even longer with the ring, I could go into the part where she goes to Richard Morgan's house. And, and he, he electrocutes, electrocutes himself in the bathtub. bathtub. Like, like, I could, I could add, add more of those great scenes, scenes that you had to cut away in order to get to just the most important stuff. So, so if, if you find yourself already at the end, I would probably suggest cutting it there rather than trying to say, by the way, add this in. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Sure. sure. Other, Other questions? questions? Yeah, I'm just wondering. So the way this... Uh, meetup is gonna go is we're gonna actually have time to kind of write out our thing or are we gonna go straight to pitching so you're going to share the the title genre yes. comps and log line in the chat uh -huh. and then you don't have to have anything else written out the rest of it you can just do like i just did here you don't you don't have to turn in like a paragraph or multiple paragraphs of the, the pitch text um so the only things you yeah. have to have written are the title genre log line comps 
Yeah, okay. So are we mostly here to generate an actual pitch, or are we going to be practice pitching? Well, um, the idea is, is for these workshops yes. is usually you practice the you practice it a few times, and now you're ready to try it out. Um, if you haven't yeah. practiced it before, you can, this could be your very first time attempting it if you want. Yeah, I understand. I don't think I got anything ready, but now that I know about these, I'll definitely have one uh, soldiered up for next time. But thank you. Okay, yeah, no problem. You can, yeah, you can always, if you haven't pitched something before, you can try it for the first time. I only spent like 10, 15 minutes practicing on the, the ring. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, and, um, you, you know, you have to just learn by doing it sometimes, so no big deal. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, of course. Um, if anything, I'll try and get something ready a little bit. You know, anything I can throw out, but, sure. yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah no, no problem. problem. Other, Other questions? questions? Okay, okay, if, if there's, there's no, no other questions, questions let's post log lines in the chat. Make sure to include title, genre, and comps. And I'll start placing them into our shared document here so we can all see them. Thank you, Nerdy Boy Crafter. Let's see. Anyone else have logline genre and comps to share with us? You can go ahead and post that now in the Classroom channel. Mouse over in the voice channel that says Classroom. Find the white word bubble that says Open Chat. You can paste all the text in there. I'll give you guys just a minute to do that. If you're watching on one of our other channels like Twitch, Facebook, or Twitter, you can also share logline genre and comps in the, the chat of the client that you're on or of the, the site that you're on. Um, I don't think you'll be able to speak with us, though, unless you join us on Discord. So you should come by scriptcamp.net and get the link to join our Discord server and participate in this free interactive class. All right, I'll give you guys about um, 10 more seconds and then we'll go with just the posts as we receive them in order. start with nerdy boy crafter with cryptic corridors i love the title and then while we're doing this you guys should post yours in the chat if you'd like to join the queue um can't guarantee that we can get to everyone but given this how not that many have been shared so far you could say then um we are you the floor is open you will have a chance to pitch today if you'd like to let's start with crafter okay so cryptic corridors is like a this is a tv pilot episode and it tells a story that takes place in 1995 in the small town of Fernerly Falls. And what's interesting is that with this, a body was found in the middle of a park. And the body is covered in blood. It's disgusting. It's a gruesome sight. Can we As pause just, 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 just pause for, I'm sorry, just, just pause for one second. second. So, so um, um, the yeah. way that, that I'll do this, so I just want to make sure, I'll read the log line first and then... I just, I just want to make sure okay. I, get, I get that before you go into the, the full pitch, and then I'll put the clock on to, to make sure that you um, were staying within our three-minute guideline. So why don't we just start with the log line? Go ahead with that. So in 1995, in the small town of Fernelli Falls, Oregon, uh, this town finally found the body of the missing teenager Henry Anderson on video camera. Under mysterious circumstances, FBI agent Jason Palmer sent down to investigate. 
Jason will soon find that Henry wasn't the only missing kid, and that he has constant dreams of a strange place with mono yellow wallpapers, moist carpets, and moist carpets, along with a constant reminder that something is hopefully wrong. Uh, Alright, thanks, thanks for that. Let me just, just make sure, sure I understand. understand. So, so the, the, the first thing is, so a log line should be, in, for a TV show, we have two separate log lines. We have the series log line, and, and we have the pilot log line. line. Um, I, can't I can't tell which uh, okay. of these this, this necessarily is. is. I, think I think this might be the Oh, series. this is, this is just, this is like, this is the series log line, but the pilot log line is, you know, probably the beginning part where he's going to investigate the missing body, I mean the body and how it, how he died. Right, right, right. okay. okay. Um, so, so, then, then uh, uh, just, just looking at this as, as a series log line, it's still far too long and includes way too many details. details. Um, especially, especially when it comes down to, to we're talking about what, what the specifics of the clues are, yellow, yellow wallpaper and moist carpets and things, things like that. that. Just, just way, way, way too granular of detail for a log line. Um, so, so the, the year is important, so okay, 1995, small town of Fernelli Falls, the Oregon police find and we, we got to keep this all in present tense. We can't go in past, past tense. So find the body of a missing teenager named Henry Anderson along with a video camera. Under mysterious circumstances, FBI agent Carter, Jason Carr, is sent to investigate. Why is it mysterious that somebody would be sent to investigate a murder? Because it wasn't the first. He wasn't, he's like, wasn't the first body. And a lot of kids have gone missing in the town. But what's even stranger is that it's not only this town it's other towns around the states but do you see how this sentence suggests that it's it says under mysterious circumstances an fbi agent is sent to investigate but it's really not mysterious at all why an fbi agent is set to investigate the mystery is what he discovers afterwards right so i think it's just a misleading sentence um we just don't need this this part here um yeah along with the video camera is the video camera relevant Yes, it is highly relevant. For, for a logline, log though? For a logline, yes. Why is it relevant for the logline? Well, it's relevant... Actually, it's not. Let's it's just get rid of it. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, and it, and it might be, be if it's like... like and it, maybe, maybe it would be more relevant, relevant for the pilot logline, log line, if it's like, this is... And their only source of clues yeah. is this video camera that has an image of this and this on it, or something something like that. That might be maybe more relevant for the pilot logline, but for the series... I don't, I don't think, think we, we need, need to go into, into the, the details, details of the clues. Uh, um, okay. Okay, so, uh, in, in, in 1995, a small town, okay, the police find the body of a teenager. He's not, not missing anymore, but um, they, they find, find, find the body of a teenager. teenager. Okay. okay. FBI, FBI agent is sent down to investigate. Jason will soon find that Henry wasn't the only missing kid. And that he, when you say he, whom do you refer to? He meaning the agent himself? Soon Jason will find, okay. So, so he, he has, has constant, constant dreams of a strange place with yellow wallpaper and moist carpets, along with a yeah. constant reminder that something is horribly wrong. Besides the fact that a kid got murdered here and a bunch of kids got murdered here? Well, yes, because there's like a more deeper thing to it than just the murders. And it's not even actually a murder, too. I mean, you might, it could be presented in that way to where. It might seem like a murder, but I'm not trying to make it seem like a murder, if that makes okay. sense. Well, well the, the only, only if, if you, you find, find someone, someone who's dead, dead the, the options are either murder, suicide, or accident, or accident right? right? So, so I think they would assume mm -hmm. it was foul play, play at first. first. Um, so, so we can, right. you, you can, that, that, that can, can be, be fine to leave with for the log line. line. But the, the, the thing that I want to focus on here is that dreams of a strange place with yellow wallpaper and moist carpets, way too much detail. Just, I'm not seeing what's important about that in a series log line. So you can maybe, maybe say something like, like he starts, starts having prophetic dreams. dreams. See how yeah. that might be like yeah, something like that's important. They're prophetic, so they're going to come true, or they are important, or he's dreaming about omens or something. Yeah. Some supernatural effect they're in just, his dreams. I would say it's supernatural, but the dreams are mainly like meant to hint towards how like Henry really died, or like what's really going on with everything, happening with all the missing teenagers and everything. Oh, so they're, they're like more, they're visions. Visions. cryptic things. They're not visions. They're cryptic things, if okay. you will. Okay. Um, so, so, how are they, are they not visions, visions though? If they're, they're actual, actual, they're, they're flashes, flashes of things that are really happening in the world that are informing him, sort of giving him clues as to what the answers are to this central question, right? Yeah, but think of it as like this. So think of him being like sort of transported to like an 
alternate sort of dimension world of sorts. And in this place, it gives him like all the it gives him answers very cryptically and creepily as to how the kid died and to how many more people have died in the past and all of that kind of stuff. I see. Okay. okay. Um, so, so we might want to put, put it some, something like Jason will soon find that Henry wasn't the only missing child and prophetic dreams will lead him to a much vaster conspiracy or something like that. I mean, yeah. I think that... Think of like, you know, you know the like the lodge and like uh, Twin Peaks with like the like the the curtains and everything and the weird pattern flooring. Mm -hmm. Think of it like the place that he goes to sort of like that, but it's not that so it's like but it's not the that. wallpaper as I was telling. Think you know the back rooms. Mm -hmm. So it's that. That's where he goes. It's sort okay. of that it place. And then there's many more places within that area that he goes to. He wanders around, or that somebody tells him what happens. You know. That, that happens, happens in the, the whole show is. Yeah, no, this is just something that happens throughout the show, but. But not. In um, that. not in the pilot. The opening kind of shows something cryptic about the back rooms, but that's pretty much it. Like the Wait. opening of the pilot. So the but but, but you're, you're not going to be able to then expand on that if that, that doesn't. You're, you're saying the pilot, pilot doesn't touch on that at all anymore. So, so it's, it's really, really only something, something that theoretically would be in later episodes. Well, no, the pilot touches on it a lot. I would mainly say that it emphasizes it in like the opening and the and like towards the end of the on the towards the end of the pilot episode. Uh, okay. Which is which? The video camera is where it comes in handy. Um, do you want me to tell you how, or is it not? Um, give, give, give me one, one second, second just for um, comments before we go into to pitch itself. So um, okay. the, the first thing is, um, if traveling into some alternate dimension is really key to the show, that needs to be in the logline. But now I'm confused because it sounds like you're saying that's not even in the pilot, so it's not that it's not going to be that key to the show, and the hook is becoming murkier and murkier. So the, so the hook, hook right now, now I'm, I'm not even sure what it is, because, because like, how, how many shows do we have where an FBI agent, agent shows up in a small town to investigate a, a murder, right? right? And, a and lot, we've yeah. Seen tw we've seen Twin Peaks before, so we, we've seen a show yeah. that's almost exactly like this. And now you're saying the thing that actually sounds like it's setting this a bit apart, which is this cool alternate yeah. dimension back room thing, isn't even in the yeah. pilot. That starts to read as a story mistake to me. Um, or yeah. maybe it's that you have some other hook that you just aren't bringing forward enough, and it could be. I'm not sure what the answer is. Maybe I'll, maybe something will clarify in the in the pitch itself. So um, I'll let you go into it. Yeah. That's, I just wanted you to know those are my first thoughts. Where I'm like, I'm looking for the hook, and as soon as you started to hear what the hook might be, then you immediately like, but no, no, that's not the hook. So now I'm just like, okay, we're yeah. just doing FBI investigates a murder in a small town show. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm, look, I'm curious what the hook can be, but um, with that in mind, feel free to go ahead. I'll put three minutes on the clock, and I'll, warn, I'll wave you down when okay. you hit three, um, and uh, okay. take, take it away whenever you're ready. I'm ready. So yeah. w what the one thing that I really, what you were saying earlier about like you were confused about the whole alternate dimension thing, I will put that heavily in the show, but the one thing that sets this show apart from all the other FBI agent comes to small town shows is that there's found footage elements, and that camera I was telling you about is actually found footage of what happened to Henry. Because what happened to Henry is that he and his friend were just having a blast, just hanging out, you know, doing skateboard tricks. And, and then Henry's like, hey man, I gotta go. So he leaves his friend, and then he falls into the back rooms. And throughout the whole, you know, part where he's walking around and exploring the back rooms, he slowly starts to lose his sanity and go insane constantly looking around and feeling like someone is watching him when nothing at all is watching him no one is there so he starts to slowly lose his sanity screaming loud and loud running throughout these like en infinite endless halls until eventually he trips and falls and that's how he died he clipped through the wall and then fell from the sky and into the park and the camera was next to him and that's how the footage was found and Jason will see this sort of footage towards the end of the pilot. And throughout, and the one thing that's about this pilot is these keen characters that are like with, who were friends with Henry. And Henry told them before he died that he would have nightmares of visiting this place, the back rooms. He would have constant dreams and nightmares about visiting. And he felt that it was looking for him and trying to find him. And that was before he died. 
So it was like a constant weird thing like that. And his friends were very concerned about that. Um, it's a very creepy like that. So, and I really want to emphasize like the whole like back rooms and like dream core. If you know what dream core is, like it's basically like dream, like surreal imagery. I really want to emphasize that because I want this show to feel very, like, very, like, dream one. And especially for the pilot, too. And the thing that's more unique about it that will set it apart is I want each location in the real world and the backrooms world to be indistinguishable from another. So, for example, the park, the school, and, like, a park, a school, anything in that small town will look like a liminal space. It'll look very creepy and uncomfortable. But it's like natural in a way, so it's so it makes it like, oh my god, I'm very uncomfortable. But this is a normal place that our characters are just casually talking. So, and that's the one thing that I want it to be like is where the back rooms is very creepy and whatnot. The character, the dream life is very creepy, but in the real world, in the town, it's not so different, even though there's people in there. Um. And there'll be like locations like an office building, an arcade, a school, and all that stuff. Great, okay, okay thanks for that. that. So, um, I think that's, um, it, it, you have done a good job sort of expressing what would be unique about this, and I think that, um, that if you were to really sort of bring that out more, that would maybe give us a bit more of a uh, kind of um, an original show if these things were a part of the story. But I'm not really clear how these things are part of the story or really, I don't think we, you really took us through the story. Um, so the, the, the pitch, should, it's sort of like you explain what happens in the story as much as like, it, now and again, you can, you can take a few sentences to clarify. It's gonna be like that or I'm gonna emphasize this, but we still need to know what happens. So like, who's the antagonist? Is, is there an antagonist? Yeah, the antagonist is, like, the location itself. I more of want it to be, like, it's more of less of a person and more of, like, the place as a representation of people. And it's okay. supernatural kind of in a way like that. It can manifest as a person. Like, it can. It can be a person. But overall, its true form is the backroom sort of place itself. Okay, so, so that's I, the yeah, I would have loved to have, to have heard about this in the in in the pitch because that sounds like yeah, it, it's hard to imagine what we're doing in it. Like, like I said, we we really want to emphasize what makes this feel like a show. And if we don't have any sense of what we're up against, then it becomes very difficult. Like you know, Stranger Things, we wouldn't really have an idea of what the show was unless it was like the demo gorgon stole the kid from the yeah. art dimension and brought it into the bad dimension. There's this faction yeah. of evil scientists that are trying to recapture the psychic girl who can get to the demo gorgon. It's like we have a just a, a sense, sense of who, who the characters, characters are and what they're up against and what the obstacles are. Here, I think that so when, when you're when you're pitching this, and let me ask, I guess maybe have you have you written this already, or is this just an idea at the moment? Um, I've written this. I've got like the first page, thirty pages down on in the script. Um, it's very the script is very basic. I've never really written a script on that before, but I'm sort of like have this idea for the story and the pilot and how I mm. want it to go. Um, but some parts that you were saying like oh it's not advertising. I think, like, it should. So, like, I realized looking back at it and thinking about it, it doesn't really emphasize it much. I mean, it's more of taking the back seat for characters because my I really want to really develop characters and really get you to know them and close to them because mm -hmm. I feel that, like, yeah, the back rooms and stuff is creepy, but I don't want flat and boring characters. Either. I don't want you to understand them. Like, I want the characters to have emotions and to feel like real people with real flaws. And so like the first sure. 30 pages basically developing. Like it has the background stuff, but you're mainly seeing characters and not so much that kind of stuff. But we can do but we can develop characters at the same time as they're doing cool stuff though, right? Like I mean, we've seen many examples yeah. of that. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a binary choice of one or the other. Um, so I, I guess I would suggest, and maybe this is gonna be feedback for your pitch but also just feedback for your story um that you want to bring the thing that you've promised and the thing that is unique really to the forefront 
So, so especially, especially when you're pitching what the story is, this would be something like, you know, an FBI agent is called to a small town to investigate a murder of a teenager, but he soon discovers this teenager had been exploring a strange otherworldly dimension. Like, we don't want to leave that in the background. Yeah. You want to give right. us that right away. And then we, we understand, okay, so the show is going to be, the detective is trying to figure out how do you get to that dimension? And once he's there, does he yeah. get stuck there for a while? And like, how does yeah. he, it's like, what's it called? But, um, Channel Zero, season three, Butcher's Block. Or like House of Leaves, or like, you know, these other shows yeah. and things that work with these, you know, unknowable limited, liminal spaces and things like that. that that's all very cool. But um, you got to give us more of the actual journey into it rather than dancing around the premise in the pitch itself. Yeah. So I hope that's helpful, and maybe that'll give you some ideas of how to maybe restructure and reformat what you have already. Because if you're saying it's yeah. the first 30 pages, we don't, we don't really delve into that, and we don't really deliver on... The thing, the thing that, that people, people would be excited about, about just hearing about this idea, which is basically yeah. Twin Peaks meets what's it called? Uh, the back rooms. The, in the back, yeah, yeah Twin, Twin Peaks meets back rooms. Sure, you can do that. Um, and, and, and if that's the case, then we want to get that. We want to make sure that in the pitch, by the end of like the first minute, we're like, oh wow, cool, this FBI agent is going to be exploring an alternate dimension. That's the hook of the show. Yeah. And maybe, and maybe there's, like, maybe you can sort of hint out as well. Bring in, a, a, especially with TV, we want to understand how this is going to last for years. Years of entertainment, yeah. which means we, we like to have a cast. You don't need to give us names of the cast. But you can give us right. things like, you know, and then he's going to, the main character starts to interview other people who have also explored the backrooms. And they have, like, a club of backroom explorers that have been, you know, trying to crack, crack a way to get in there. And maybe they think there's a treasure in there or something. Like, maybe just build out the right. world a little bit more. You can't get too crazy. We can't. I know we, I said don't don't add too much scale and scope. But it, it did feel like yeah. it finished early in this one, and I was left like, and where's the rest of it? Where's the rest of it? <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe that'll give you some ideas. Does that help you out? A little bit. And the one thing that I want planned this show from the beginning is that I just want it to be one season. So it's like a, like I wanted it to be like I'm not sure how long one season shows last. Like sometimes they're like 13 episodes, sometimes they're 22 episodes, and then yeah. other times they're 10. So for, for a drama, I'm still trying for, to figure for out. Hour long drama is usually um, uh, going to be eight to 12. Um, for a comedy, for a half hour comedy, it's going to be more like 22. Okay, yeah. but like so, for the show Supernatural, for instance, that, that's like 22 episodes a season. That's and true. It's like that is a network. Drama. That's a network procedural, um, so that's going to... Nowadays, if, if you see a limited series on Netflix or HBO or Showtime or something like that, it'll probably be 8 to 10 episodes. Um, it's usually okay. 8 or 10. Um, it can, I've seen them go up to 12 now and again. Um, but for a network, for a network show, um, super, like something like Supernatural or Law & Order or shows like that, I know they're an hour long, but yeah, those are sort of more syndicated, like... Um, uh, procedural type shows end up usually getting 22 episode seasons like csi i think also gets that um so yeah it just depends on the network it ends up on you don't have to worry about that for trying to break into tv writing though because the nice thing yeah. that sort of frees us is the fact that we probably won't get any more episodes in the pilot so you really have to put all the best stuff into the pilot yeah I hope this is helpful and answers some of your questions and maybe gave you some ways to reshape or, or guide this con the, the construction of this moving forward. Did you have any questions on this? Um, Kind of, because I'm still like, because I'm a little tired, so things are kind of a little bit going over my head. So um, the thing that, what would what would be one thing that you would want to see from this show that wasn't like, because um, I think you were saying that the FBI agent trying to get into the back rooms was one thing. Sure, you mean just the plot elements that I think would be cool? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure, okay. Yeah, it'd be cool if there was um, societies of people who explore or have different relationships to this. The back rooms, I would love to see, you know, um, the uh, people's attempts to chart or map them out, um, which I know always end up with strange disasters and stuff like House of Leaves, because you end up with these great sequences of characters walking around holding a thread like they're going through the labyrinth of the Minotaur, and then it gets mysteriously yeah. snipped or something like that. I like, I like to, to sort of imply like maybe societies. Or there's a, there's a movie, um, or is it a French show called Beyond the Walls, which you should check out, which is a little bit like this, yeah. um, and has a sort of like a, a, a feeling of like there's people that have been lost in this other world so long they start forming their own cultures, which is always kind of cool. Um, so yeah. I don't know. There's a couple of just random ideas for you. Maybe people in the chat uh, will have more uh, um, just random scattered ideas that might help you out. All right. Thank you. 
I really appreciate you helping out, telling me what I need to do, because um, this was actually my very first pitch. I never really pitched anything before, so, and I really want to practice more and more with this kind of thing, because I love hearing, I love hearing criticism and stuff, because in my opinion, constructive criticism, because it really helps me to be able to really put things into the forefront and some things into the background. Um, cause I, I always like to consider myself as a really good story writer. It's just a matter of what's more important for the story and what should be left out or what should right. be put aside. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's what, what pitching, pitching is all about. Cutting, cutting things that aren't important, important away and just leaving us with the core of the experience. So yeah, yeah practice, practice it some more. You'll, you'll definitely get there. Yeah. Do you know where any places where I could practice pitching? Um, cause I'm not, cause I know there'll be events and stuff, but it's like, I want to be able to continuously practice. So I right, can better, like, like a, a regular, regular spot, spot for it. Um, we, yeah. we have, um, genre groups, like we have a fantasy group, we have a horror group, we have a comedy group. If you, if you have stuff that fits into one of those categories, then the groups for those classes will just, you can just pitch stuff there week after week if you want. Um, if it, if it doesn't fit into any of those genres, we may have to start a new group for it, or there. I'm sure there's something on Script Camp that can that would serve that purpose. So we've got plenty of stuff going on. Keep an eye on the calendar, and um, we can. You can also just if you record yourself, like Nasha just mentioned in the chat, if you record yourself, you can just post it on feedback if you just want to get sort of feedback from anyone on the server that way. Um, yeah. So a couple options there. And one thing that I was thinking about doing was that. On YouTube, a lot of these YouTubers do, like, the bathroom stuff, like Kane Parsons, have you heard of him? He, like, he did a series in the backgrounds. One thing that I want to do is, like, I guess in order to pitch the series better would be, like, to make a sort of, like, video like that to where you actually have the character running around and exploring the backgrounds. And it sure. would just, like, give out the main important details of the show. And that would... Would that... Would you think that would be a good pitch to where the video... Because, like, it's... The backgrounds where you see the character running around in it instead of the camera. Um, and it's like basically exploring the main bits of the background rooms in the show itself, but in a different sort of way. Because on YouTube, you see a bunch of these people, like, as I said, Kane, to where he does a bunch of videos. Like, his first backgrounds video showed a guy who was filming a horror film, and then he gets no clipped into the backgrounds. And then when he gets no clip, you see him explore and get chased by a monster. But of course, mine's going to be different, but it's still the same kind of format. If you can pull that off, then yeah, yeah sure. Um, yeah. Or, but you could do anything. You could do like an audio only version of this. You could do like um, an animated version. There's there's pretty much endless options. Um, if you're going to be writing a full length pilot, then usually people are doing that because they want to break into the industry as TV writers, and they're going to be using yeah. these scripts as like a, a sample to try to get staffing meetings and stuff. I get the feeling maybe yeah. that's not exactly your objective at at the moment. No, but... it is. Oh, it is. I just. Yeah, I want to be able to write, like, a TV pilot for this. Mm -hmm. um, so, because, as I said, I've written the first few pages on Final Draft. Um, right. So, but I'm just trying to really figure out the story. Because right now, I'm just going to be honest, it's sort of... I wouldn't say it's a concept, but I wouldn't say it's fully fleshed out either. Because mm -hmm. um, I have other stories that I've written that are really fleshed out. And, care and like, details in the world and stuff. Um... And I would mainly say that this story is, like, not well fleshed out. But at the same time, it's a story that I have written out. Because I had a horror movie in the past that I made, but I scrapped it because I didn't like it. Because it felt too generic. Um, so this is sort of a unique story that I'm writing that I feel is unique. Especially if I put that stuff to the forefront. Because if mm -hmm. I just say the stuff about the FBI agent in a small town... It's gonna be oh well, it's wayward times. So when these, right. but it looks a little different. You know? Exactly. Yeah, I think, I think you, you got, got it there. And yeah, just just keep working on it. I'm sure you'll find some form or some medium um, that you can realize it in. And we have um, yeah. a TV writing class too. If you're interested, a new one starts on March 5th. That's a free free intro class, March 5th at 11 a.m. If you want to just learn how to write TV, just 101 beginning to end. Yeah, would that go over like formatting for the script and whatnot? Or we touch on formatting, but we don't really like the way that we do the classes. The first half of the course is all just figuring out what happens in the episode and outlining and pre-writing, and we don't actually start writing scenes until the second half of the class. So it's not really as much about formatting as it is about structure. 
and organization and figuring out what happens on every page before we begin. Okay. But the best way to learn format, start reading pro TV scripts. Um, I recommend read three of them a week. Yeah, because I found this one website that was like, I think it was, for, it's a weird website, but it basically lists like every pilot for a TV show. Like I found like Quantum Leap. From, the show did terrible, but it's still like a pilot. It was written out. Um, yeah, 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 check the chat. I'll, I think I'll leave a link, link for a, a Google group that has tons and tons of TV scripts to read. So there's plenty, plenty to choose from. Yeah, I think this is actually the website. Yeah, this is the website I found. Yeah, this, this is quite a well-known one. It's really good. So, so yeah, yeah, start reading and taking notes and paying a lot of attention and just reading really actively. And that's how you improve. You read, you write, and you move on to the next project. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to our next pitch. We have um, Kanye Wonders. I think that's Merck. Yep, the one and only. All right. Are you going to... Well, let's start with... Um, can you read out the logline for us, please? Of course. When a metalhead is possessed by a prankster demon, he must end its manipulation by visiting a cryptic confessional priest for any hope of surviving musicals. <laughs> Almost in one go. School. Music school. Okay. So, yeah. a couple, couple things are capitalized. For, uh, we don't need to capitalize priest, metalhead, or music school. Mm -hmm. here. Okay. Um, when, and this is a movie, right? Yep. Okay, okay. let's take a look. <clears throat> when a metalhead is possessed by a prankster demon, he must end its manipulation by visiting a cryptic confessional priest for any hope of surviving music school. Dark comedy, adult swim slapstick with a coming-of-age band drama. Okay, great. Um, I'm into the concept, I just want to make sure I understand. What is a confessional priest? Oh, like he visits a confessional. So, but he doesn't stay in the confessional the whole time, does he? No, it's weekly. But, so, do we... Is that word helping, helping us, or is it just confusing us? It's, he has to join forces with the priest, right? Uh, basically, the idea is that he has a window of time to figure out stuff from this priest. The priest clearly knows things, and... He clearly is giving at least some valuable information, but uh, it's going to be sort of mystical, right? He visits the priest once a week and um, only has that window of opportunity, and I want that to be a matter of stakes for the story. Like, not only is he managing the demon, but he's managing his life, and he's managing trying to figure out what the priest actually means in order to, um, you know, forward the narrative of he's under a lot of pressure, how does he get rid of this demon? Okay. Um, I think we can just say something like, with, with the help of a cryptic priest, I'm not sure the, conf mm -hmm. the confessional thing was just confusing. Yeah, me. yeah. Um, so, for any hope of surviving music school, let me just see if we can move this clause. So, because this has, we want to avoid having too many clauses that are like, when this happens, uh, for, yeah. for this, with the help of this, there's too many conjunction clauses, I guess we'd call them. That makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah, when a metalhead is possessed by a prankster demon, he must end his manipulation with the help of a cryptic, cryptic priest for any hope of surviving music school. So he's in school for, like, metal-style music? Or is is he just... Hmm. I guess uh, that, he's that not, could be a... Yeah. That could be This a, is... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. What I find interesting is I know nothing about music school. I have plenty of friends who are going, and this is kind of something I want to ingrain in this narrative. It's the realism aspect of it, of either music school, metalhead culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to preface that, that during my pitch, I'm going to kind of go willy-nilly, and I'm not even going to bother thinking like, oh, shit, is that even something happens? Music school, from what I hear, I assume is composition classes, rehearsal classes, and then, like, um, like, you, you make a piece or something by the end of the, literally, I don't know, but, like, you make a piece by the end of a class, right? So I'm going to assume these types of classes, and I'm kind of running with that. At least for the pitch. Um, I, I just, just want, want to make sure, sure I understand. understand. So, he, the fact that you described him as a metalhead, 
and then yes. saying he's trying to survive to the end of music school. Yeah. Those things that you're saying there is inherently a bit of a subversion of expectations here because this is it the, most of the time when people are in music school it's not for playing metal right i guess it's possible yeah yeah um, but you're saying is he like a classical student um this is where i guess you probably got me connor as someone who knows music yourself but i was assuming he would at least go for audio production oh or no, that's, that's, no, that's kind of no, yeah, right. yeah 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 i was just wondering if i should be describing him as when a musical when a music school student gets possessed like because i think that's how you had it a little bit before and i was just wondering why would we describe him as a metalhead first but i guess now that you did you put it you did put it as music school okay um yeah. so yeah i was i guess i was just wondering how those things connected now that you've explained it it does make sense to me but remember that we can describe somebody in many different ways for instance, you can describe somebody as a metalhead. You could describe somebody as, you know, when a hopeful music school student, like that just might be more relevant for the purposes yeah. of, of, of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, when a, when a, a music school student in his senior year or an audio production student in his senior year, whatever it is, if, yeah. if we, we might want to choose that instead of metalhead if that's going to have more relevance for the purposes of the logline because right now uh, it doesn't necessarily, it's not clear how it fits into the story yet. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I like the idea I, I, of the, you know, yeah. of, of, I was, of the metalhead. But go ahead. Thank you. I was thinking of taking away metalhead because, uh, for the exact same reason, I was just almost afraid because, like, it is a snappy line. Like, mm -hmm. but I get what you mean. Like, it tell for the functions of that log line, we need a music school student who's going to music school, and that immediately sets that up. Right, right, right. Otherwise, it's mm -hmm. gonna be like it, it just comes out of nowhere and. It does. It's, it's not clear like, yeah, how, it connect, yeah. how, how it connects and how it all makes sense. So yeah, I, I would lose the metalhead thing and actually replace that with something like explaining his connection to the school and that that's what matters to him for the purposes of this story. Yeah. Okay. All right, then. Hope that's clear. With that any yeah. questions before we go into the ditch? Yeah, sure. I just want to get this one. A. Um. Did you paste the entire? Uh. You did you revise the logline yourself or? I'm gonna, uh, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not, not like a final version, but I can paste, paste it back in the chat if you want. No. Yeah. Paste it. Yeah. And then I can like. Sure. Uh, bump out see. Anything from the forward. There you go. Oh, I don't think I marked it up too much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. So um, with the help. Of, yeah, I think mm -hmm. with the help of the priest was the part that I changed here. But... Yeah. Yeah. You'll have to just oh, no, yeah, I get that. The but character. thank you, thank you. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you ready to go into the pitch part? All right. I'm ready. Okay, okay. take it away. So, when Gerard, a metalhead student in music school, is confronted with a demon uh, in his car. This is our first intro scene. He's driving down and... He's uh, enjoying his time, but the demon uh, keeps licking his ear, and this is kind of the exasperated humor we're going to get throughout the first act, where the demon proves himself to not only be able to um, manipulate Gerard's senses during, the, uh, during his rehearsal classes, so that he's um, not being able to play with any, but any of the other students, uh, we see him um, concoct lies uh, to the point where, you know, he's in his friend with his friends and um, uh, he's in with uh, a group who's talking about metal and he uh, says he's like, uh, he exaggerates to the point where he says he's not only friends with the lead guitarist of Behemoth, but that he also... Um, that he also, um, dang it, but he, <laughs> You're good. Uh, yeah, yeah, that he also, um, knows the, is on first name basis with him, and finally is in a NSFW relationship with him, right? And these are all kind of the demon's pranks, where his friends definitely believe that, but he's also on the aspect of, like, completely bullshitting. Um, finally, uh, we have it so that he is uh, he is prone to um, bits of 
expressing emotions that he would otherwise repress. Uh, and this is also played for humor, so I'm not even pitching, but like, <laughs> I'm not even using the language of pitching, but uh, here we go. He's, um, he's, um, uh, he, so for instance, when he, uh, when he's in, um, so for instance, when he's uh, listening to metal music. Uh, he's relenting his aggression, but he gets so aggressive that he um, uh, he destroys one, uh, his neighbor's headlight. Um, he goes out and just destroys his neighbor's headlight. Uh, he, you have it so that when his mother, who he still lives with, dang it, that's a, probably a detail you should get at the beginning. That's okay. <laughs> you get it. Where he's, his mother, who he still lives with, um, uh, he, uh, he's basically taking, he's like, taking care of him, uh, while he's still going to school, basically has it so that, uh, he's very pensive around her, which the demon turns into outright listening to all her commands, and this mother, who is old and blind, dang it, but... This mother who is old and blind is um, basically convincing the uh, kid to do whatever the hell he wants because every time he gets pensive around her, the will turn that into outright brutal submission. That gets us out of the first act where... That was just the, all the first act? <laughs> that was all just the first act. Okay, okay, we, we gotta, gotta stop. stop. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, so we're we're past our the end of our time limit. Um, yeah. So we don't want to spend the whole time on our first act, of course, because then yeah. we, we don't have a sense, sense of what the movie is. Um, mm -hmm. So good job, just just going for it and just and you know just taking a big swing. It's a crazy idea, and I I like the the basics of the idea for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think that so when let, let me just. Um, walk through the first couple things that happen in the story and you'll tell me if i'm right or if i'm wrong does that sound okay of course thank you okay so there's a music student that is secret maybe not secretly there's a music student who is really into metal and he's going to school for audio production right yes he's really into his classes and he really wants to pass yes and he wants to and he's doing well or doing poorly uh he's doing poorly thanks doing to poorly. this demon oh wait hang on mm -hmm. When does the demon take him over? Before the movie begins? So, the way I want to see it is that he only acknowledges the demon's presence by the time of the priest. Um, so, really, he's there, and he's clearly acting out, and he doesn't know why, but at the same time, um, it's that he's clearly, like, doing terribly, and the end of the first act is him putting that weight on himself. And not knowing anything to do with it. The end of the first act is him doing that, going to the priest, and then the priest shows like the priest acknowledges the demon and he and that's when he like literally freaks the fuck out and is like, dude, I'm angry. There's a demon here and all this shit in the first act. Now the demons it's the demon's fault. What the hell? <laughs> okay, literally. so it, it feels like we're we're rushing at ten thousand miles an hour through mm -hmm. the story. To, yes. Especially because I think you're saying that what I thought was the catalyst actually happens before the story even began, and that we never yes. see him unpossessed by the demon. We don't get a sense of his no. normal life. And yeah. it's hard to calibrate when your movie feels like it starts on the highway at 55 miles an hour, and then uh -huh. it sets on fire by the end of the first act. And that's not necessarily yeah, yeah. A, a good thing. I know that sounds like kind of cool when I put it like that. Um, <laughs> but it feels like we're... we're Somersaulting and deadly. tumbling, tumbling through the plot. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you need to slow down a little bit. And mm -hmm. in terms of this is just like story and outlining notes, maybe as much as it is with the the the, the pitching itself. But yeah. in terms of just the design of your story, we probably want to have a first. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be more than five ten minutes. But give us like mm -hmm. a beginning, a, a first act where we see there's this kid who really wants to pass music school, but. He's, you know, his grades are starting to slip. We, we get invested in this character a little bit before we start. And then he gets possessed by a demon, right? You're and right. That, 
and then we see yeah. the effect that that has on him. If we never saw what he was like before the demon possessed him, it becomes very <laughs> difficult for us to care what he's like now that he, we don't understand what what if we don't know what he was like before, we don't know what's so different now. And especially if you spend these first ten minutes setting up a, a main character who would be somebody that was particularly funny if if if, it, if that person were possessed by a demon, right? If we look at, have you seen Idle Hands? No. I recommend it to everybody. It's a hilarious horror comedy from 1999. It has not aged super well, and it got terrible reviews. And it's pretty offensive in some ways, but it's so well plotted, and I love it so much. Um, I know I'm gonna. It's probably fully canceled by now, but it has a great plot. The first ten minutes are the main character is the most lazy stoner in the entire world. Right, uh -huh. he spends yeah. all day just smoking weed at home. He he like he hangs out with his friends and wants to smoke weed all the time. He's the laziest yeah. person that could ever exist. And his uh -huh. right hand yeah. gets possessed by the devil and starts killing people. And, Whoa. and yeah, his just his hand though, just his because uh -huh. he's the laziest person in the world. Idle hands make the yeah. devil's play things, as the saying goes, so to speak. So that's yeah, why the yeah. devil chose him. And it makes sense. Uh -huh. And it, it not only makes sense, as, or not not only do we have the time for us to get invested in this character at the beginning, and we, you know, in the in the kind of loser way that we root for comedy characters, right? Your main character can be a loser in a, in, in a comedy, mm -hmm. and they kind of should be. They can't be mm -hmm. too cool, or else we won't really be on board for laughing at them in the way that we should be. But after mm -hmm. you know, ten minutes into the movie-ish, his hand gets possessed, and now the laziest stoner in the world is going around killing people, and no one suspects that he, it's him, obviously, because. He, he, he isn't the kind of person who would do this. So I think having that sense of who the character is before a massive change is really important for us to get the impact of that change. And that's where you might set up your main character is, you know, is he a total nerd? Is he a total, is he, is he very um, introverted? And, and, and when the demon's taking over him, does it unleash all his, all his stuff that he's holding back normally? Because we won't understand that he's holding those things back unless we see what he's like before. So I think that a solid, substantial first act will do a lot to orient us in, in the narrative and help us just get through it in our, our first couple sentences. And then I think, don't, don't feel too pressured by this, but maybe you can just kind of summarize for us what happens throughout the rest of the movie and just sort of take us towards the end. It doesn't, it's okay if it's not perfect or if you're not sure. You can say I'm not sure or I don't want to, but um, oh, can yeah. you just like suggest what happens in the rest of it for us? Uh, the idea is he meets the priest, he's balancing... Um, relationships that seem to be failing, um, but hopefully by the end, uh, there's something of, like, he can start picking them up, right? That's what I think is, like, the third act. Well, but how do we, uh, but how do we it's also, the priest yeah. go about solving the problem of the possession? So, he goes to the church... Uh, the priest is, you know, he's, he's all vague and mysterious. Like, we, we go into this church and uh, uh, everyone leaves. It's all quiet. Uh, he's the last one to the door because, you know, he's just mopey, and fuck, mopey as fuck. But he finally gets um, to the confessional and he's sitting there uh, just as, I guess, well, maybe he just, we'll work it out. But the idea is he meets the priest and he's like, the priest comes and and it, it says something about um, his childhood. It says something about his childhood that really reckons with him. Maybe it's like something about the you know the first th time he listened to metal music, something like that. Um, and like the and he's like he's freaking out. He's like, whoa, 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 how do you how do you know that? How do you know that? And he's like, I know a lot of things about you, bro. Um, I know you're this, this, and this. And this, this, and this is meant to be the most misunderstood shit in the world. Maybe it's, like, clear in hindsight, but it's not something he's, like, exactly going to pick up on, right? Let's so, pause. I'm yeah, a yeah. little lost. And so the question, yeah, yeah. The question was, how are he and the priest going to solve the problem of the possession? Ooh, it's okay he's solving it. Yeah, yeah. He's solving it, but, like, yeah, I guess I am, I'm not sure. You're but not sure. the basic idea is that he gets to see the priest once a week which is when the priest offers him to come he's like dude i'm here uh this time this week for this window of time you gotta mm -hmm. be here and you gotta know when the hell you're gonna be here okay because um if you're not here this dude this demon guy uh he's gonna keep like licking your ear and fucking up your life and shit <laughs> okay 
But, but so, so we, we just, just need, need, I think, think we're looking for a sense of a finish line, line a tangible goalpost, post, or some kind of just yeah. objectives that, that will, will help, you, help us understand, understand what the progress is through the, the story. So um, in I Like yeah. for instance, like, there's, there's this, this um, it, it turns out there's, there's this monster hunter that's looking for the spirit, the, the, you know, this demon spirit that's going around possessing people's limbs. And so they need to, you know, get the hand and they need to get a book and do a ritual in order to make it disappear or make it get them possessed. Um, and so to do that, the main characters, they need to catch the hand because it keeps escaping. It's like, you know, they cut it off his body. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, that we can imagine the hijinks that ensue is they're trying to pursue that goal of getting it to the same room as the book so they can do the ritual. So I think you just need to have something that's as clear as that, right? Like, so this priest that he, you know, they look at an ancient tome and they find out that he can, he can get, get unpossessed, unpossessed if he gets, gets a gemstone, gemstone from a cave, or if he, I don't know, what does yeah. he need to do, right? right. Like, like, what, what actual, actual what things Ooh. he needs to actually okay. do. Okay, so, uh, quick four things. One, the ending, I hope, is that he never gets rid of the demon. <laughs> okay. Um, in fact, um, he, the, the, hopefully, the idea and the therapeutic spirit I want in spirit in this screenplay is that he manages the demon. He basically is able to outsmart it. There might be something of a MacGuffin that he might use that may or may not be coded to be a Christian fidget spinner, but that's the point, is like he he either learns to live with the demon and being that the demon is uh, taking in a lot of what he's putting out, it's basically like he has to change his like outlook on life. Um, I don't know, but that's very intelligent that you tell me. Thank you. One, I'm glad you told me about this, like, uh, rush into the story, like, 45 miles per hour. Uh, that's, that's not fast. Uh, well, that is fast, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Whatever. The idea is, um, I'm glad you told me about this because, um, I wanted to really establish the threat of the demon early on. But if I don't show him, um... If I don't show him in the normal world, and, like, there's no stakes to that. It's literally just the idea that he's just some guy with a demon, um, and he's pissy all the fucking time, so how the fuck are we gonna give a shit? Mm -hmm. And I like that. And also the idea of, I really need a, a goalpost, and, like, minor goalposts, really, right? Like, how are we, what is he progressing through the narrative and doing? He's going to the priest, of course, um, but, like... In this weekly time, like, what is he doing? And I think that's definitely stuff I gotta bang up. I got it written down here. Four. Idle hands. I, love I have that. one thing to say. My name is Kanye Wenders, Connor Kyle, and you had me at cancelled. Oh, I had you at cancelled? Okay. <laughs> you had me at cancelled. Alright, great. Sold well, me on the, you sold me on the movie. Okay, well, whatever, whatever it takes. takes. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, check that out. I think it's on Tubi and, and like, sites, sites like that. that. It's not, not probably not a major streaming site. Anyway, I like, I like it. it. Um, and, and uh, it's, it's just, you know, it's the plot of person, person gets possessed and their possession causes hijinks. So maybe there's some similarities that you can look at there. Um, and it just plays really well. And it just, uh, the, the pacing and, and the way that things connect and the logic that the characters use is all just great. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps with this one. Um, that might just, this is... I suppose, I suppose to some extent, extent mostly just going to look, be, look, look like a story, story diagnosis, diagnosis more than a pitch diagnosis, diagnosis I guess, because, because it seems like maybe the story isn't all the way there yet, there or all the way, all the way figured out yet, yet. and that you're going yeah, yeah. to need to just maybe do that work to find out what the character actually has to do, where is it going, and what are we going to end up having to accomplish, like what are the big set pieces of this going to be, and like the finale, for instance, might be that big set piece, that we have to have some kind of final battle against the demon, where your main character actually realizes we need it, to work together with it instead, like like we, we, to have, have a, a, a final, final set piece, piece that show that, that can, can showcase, showcase how much the characters have changed is really nice. So, so imagine if it turns out like we end up having to work together with the demon to host a big dinner party or something like that. Yeah, like something fun or something. That gets me thinking. That gets me thinking. I might even do a dinner party, but that's that's exciting. That's I like that idea. Like sure. yes, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Or what or if they have, have to be they have to play in a band together? Like they have to like, like the demon yeah. and the guy. The demon's probably really, really good at metal, isn't he? So I mean, uh -huh. like just imagine <laughs> they have to get up on stage together. That could be cool. Mm -hmm. Some like uh, what's it called? Tenacious D in the Pick of Destiny kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, that could be fun. <clears throat> Not gonna lie, I'm pretty sure this demon inspired a lot of black metal. Oh, okay, okay, great. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, sure that, that he, he will fit, fit right, right into, into a bed, bed then, in that, in that case. case. Um, 
Yeah, yeah his new bandmate. Band he, he, maybe he could even pass him off. If, if, if the demon, demon can appear and manifest, manifest, maybe he could be like, oh, yeah, oh, that, that guy's my new, uh, he's, he's my new drummer. drummer. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's an exchange student. Oh, that's funny. Okay. That's good okay, okay, so, so just, just some ideas for you there. there. Hopefully, Hopefully that gives you some suggestions. And as, especially if one of your prompts is like adult swim type humor, you can get really wacky and really crazy with it, but it still has to be clear. We still have to know what the stakes are. We still have to know what we're where we're going and what we're moving towards. All right. Makes sense. Great. Uh, uh, any, any questions, questions on that one? one? Nah. Okay. okay. Thanks, Thanks for pitching. Connor, I had a quick question, actually. Go ahead, yeah, man. Um, I, just to clarify, I missed a little bit of what you said, but I did just want to hear you clarify this. It was like, from my understanding, the importance of a setup of your character before they get thrown into an adventure of sorts is that essentially trying to give the audience a clear understanding of character what they're sort of holding back and the type of person they are before the change because it allows us to in some sense be impacted in the same way that the character is but also be invested in that change is that the idea yeah, yeah for, sure, for sure for sure um especially, especially if they, they start out as somebody that they're like we, we could kind of be them, them or i kind of am them, them in a way like, like we, we look, look at, at almost, almost any home invasion, invasion movie, movie. Where, where the main, main character is just some meek, mild-mannered dad, right? right? But then, but then through the, the course, course of this journey, then he, beca- he has to sort of unleash his inner beast to defend his family, and, and you, know, you know, we, we sort, sort of realize what he's made of. of. But, but if, if just, just our, our opening scene, scene was, oh, the window breaks, breaks the killers are in the house, now dad's whacking it with an axe, then we wouldn't really be that impressed by it, because we didn't see him be the most nerdy milquetoast dad ever at the beginning. So, so yeah, yeah it, it, it allows, allows us to see the sort of fun of the transformation by having a really distinct change. It allows us to kind of, um, like, in, in a way that we rarely get to do in real life, watch somebody transform in a very quick time frame into, like, you know, the logical result of whatever has happened to them. Yeah, you mentioned, um, you mentioned earlier, I think I caught you say, like, you get informed in some sense by what they're holding back. Hmm. Is, is well, is there any like other examples that you might be able to refer to in, in regard to that? Just I'm just trying to visualize that type of. I know obviously that might be dependent on, on the characters, but I think I'm just trying to. That, that seems like a very useful, like very specific type of technique to utilize sure. in terms of just the character arc. Yeah. yeah so, so the things the characters are holding, holding back, back might refer to sort of if, if the movie is, becomes, becomes about, about what the strength, strength that they need to find within, within them to succeed, succeed which, which almost every story is in some, in some way, way, right? right? Um, um, so, so then, then we, we need, need to, to sort of see, see what is missing for us to, to build up the desire to watch them gain that thing. thing. If, if you, you take, for instance, let's look at Liar Liar with Jim Carrey. It's, it's a movie, movie about a, a, a lawyer. He's a really good lawyer. He's like the best, best in the world. world but he, he lies, lies all the time. And, and as, as a result, like he's always lying to his kid. Yeah, I'll be at your practice. Yeah, I'll be at your swim meet, whatever it is. And because of that, like we can see him suffer. Like his relationship with his son is starting, starting to get, get worse, worse and worse. And, and the, the fact, fact that he can never be honest with anyone is starting to, we, we, in the first act, we see that starting to crack his facade and maybe say, you know, something needs to change, I just don't know what yet. And then and when the, the catalyst, catalyst happens, that allows that change to really manifest in the world. Right, so it's sort of just an extension of the idea of, like, flaw and misbelief. Yeah, yeah I, think, I, think I think that's, that's a good way to look at it, for sure. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, do we have one more pitch we want to do? Somebody else uh, post the pitch they're going to talk out for us. We might have to end early. Anyone else want to take a swing at it? I mean, I don't really have anything to... I still don't really know enough about my story, I feel like, to um, do it. <laughs> I'd like That's to okay. have it, but I just, yeah. Do you, do you want to just spend three minutes, minutes on what you have? have? Um, I guess. I just keep getting sort of stuck on the same thing. Like, I just don't know what the real... I don't really understand the, the stakes behind, like, why chosen particular characters. Um, so the relationship, for example, I know why it's there philosophically because it contrasts what the main character is dealing with, but I don't really understand what why they would be invested in this journey. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can explain it. It's just that chiaroscuro idea. Is right? this we're doing the painting one, or is this a new movie? movie? 
anyone, yeah. So it's just uh, I don't know. I've come up. I keep trying to come up with different log lines. You know, there's. I think the one that I worked on with you was like. I think originally one of the flaws you, we we've come to though was like, um, I was emphasizing this idea of like a mysterious suitcase, but it really is just a suitcase full of money. So it's not all that mysterious because it's revealed pretty early. So that didn't really work. So the original one that we had was like after his favorite painting goes missing on his watch. I think it was something like an obsessed risk of a security guard must use the contents of a mysterious suitcase of money and the help of a reckless actress to find it. But it's more like contents of a suitcase full of money. <laughs> but that's right. not really worded very well. Um, the only other thing I had, I don't even know if this necessarily fits with what I want to write about. It's like I could make it that it's more about socially anxious security guard enlisting the help of a reckless actress to sort of like teach him how to convincingly I guess play the role of a detective but part of the problem with that as well it's like you know structurally it might fit kind of what the story I want it to be about but I think I wanted to make it more so that neither of them sort of realize that's what they're doing for each other mm. so that would be what's happening but I don't want to make it obvious that she is directly knowing that she is helping him do that. I don't want to make it very clear that um, he knows exactly why she's getting involved. Now, part of the problem is, as I said, I don't really know why she is involved outside of one very, very low stakes thing. But it's hard to explain without going too far into it. So I was just mm -hmm. curious if you had any ways that I could. I don't know. I've got. I guess I don't really have it as much as a specific question as always, which is one of my problems with this, but I'm sort of just running into some issues as to what those initial fun and games moments are and what justifies the break into two. It's like, is it him teaming up with the girl or is it like, I don't really have any ideas for what else to do in that regard, right? Hmm. So I don't know if that makes sense. But yeah. Well, um, I, I guess, guess we, we could, could just... just... Uh, t if, if nobody, nobody else has a pitch, pitch that they are doing at the moment, moment I could just give you some ideas right, or yeah. su suggestions right now. But let me just check first. Does anybody else have a pitch that they want to go into before we discuss this for our last like 10 minutes or so? Maybe not. Mashoud. I guess that's a no. Okay. Um, so uh, my, my suggestion for you would be to think of the fun, like, like what, what would be fun to watch? watch? Like, like what are we watching? Like what, when, when you imagine the middle of the movie, the trailer, the posters, just where is the fun of the idea? Is it, is it in watching this guy break out of his shell and become less introverted and anxious and watching him take risks and challenge himself and push himself into dangerous situations? Or is it watching him try to connect with another person? Just just think of like, where is the fun here? And what, what drew you to this in the first place? Yeah, so it's, it's a... Uh... It's kind of so. Those are good. Those are great questions that I don't have great answers to. But I think it's mainly like if you were to look at like the second act, it's almost like if you want to make it five acts, right? It's like that second act is split into two. Um, and so one of the ways that I'm looking at it, that it's structurally they're very tonally very different as well, which is sort of meant to be the point. But the first half would half would be kind of like a very innocent, just trying to find a painting, detective. -y. It's more about the relationship between him and this girl. So it's even like borderline rom commy. Um, just kind of just like him, as you sort of said, going from sort of a, an introverted sort of place to putting on this act and sort of as he's in sort of interrogating people that he's suspicious of within the uh, art gallery that he works off uh, with, it's kind of simultaneously him working his way through like the, the the social politics, if that makes sense. Like it's almost like. He's at the bottom of the barrel, if that makes sense, and it's kind of like more and more as he's trying to sort of as he follows his suspects to like the highest heights in some sense of that gallery. He's sort of has to earn each of their respect to even get their time in order to do so. And so it's this weird thing where it's almost like he actually not only is feeling more confident, but it sort of seems to be presenting itself as true to him because of his ability to actually earn these people's respect. But the problem is that as he's trying to sort of fit into this system in order to do this, he's simultaneously losing himself to the act that he's been putting on. And by the second, by the midpoint, the point was meant to be that 
that whole act and that whole facade that he's put on, he thinks is now this identity that he's created for himself. You just, it's all of the consequences for him doing so. And it's more about him, like, now getting the shits with the fact that, like, as much as he's put this act on and as much as it seems like he's found himself at that point, it's been, like, even worse. And so now it's, like, him sort of trying to break out of the system and tear it down in some sense and almost get a little bit angry at that. So I have, like, that's the general, more, like, structure and tone, but I guess the general question, that you, or more specific question you're asking is, like, what are the actual, like, scenes that we're seeing him, like, sort of do? And I, I don't necessarily have... Uh, I don't have enough clear answers on that. Like, I know there's him searching for the painting. I know there's him gathering clues. I know there's him, like I said, uh, doing, like, flirtatious scenes with this act with this girl. I know there's him uh, going from, like, insecure to, to, um, to confident to a certain degree. I know there's going to be moments where he would have to be pretending to be that as well, and even though he's inside not that. I do have general, like, aspects of what that would be, I guess it's just how to communicate that within a logline. And I don't know if I have a specific enough um, gist of what it is that we're actually doing. Like, because, especially because the second half of that second act isn't actually about him in relation to... Um, he wouldn't actually be interacting with, the, with that actress again until about the third act. And it's hard at that point to make it, like, this is what this story is going to be fundamentally about, and a good chunk of that second act isn't even going to be about that. Um, and also, that second that second half of the second act, I want to make it where, like I said, tonally it would shift. It would go from him trying to find his painting, and I mentioned there's like that suitcase full of money. The second half of that second act is essentially where the people who are responsible for originally owning that would end up sort of tracking it down and getting involved. And so it's more about him dealing with that at that point, along with still trying to find this uh, this painting. And so I don't know how to explain that outside of that, but is that clear at all, or is there more specificity that I could give to you? To I, understand I mean, I, I think, think I mostly, mostly see what, what you're saying, saying, that the trajectory of the story is. I mean, we've gone over the plot um, before in classes, classes um, um, so, so I, I think, think we, we all just see, I think we can see, see the basics, basics of it. it. Um, I, I think, think you, you just, just need, need to figure out, before, before you can pitch this, you need to figure out what your major set pieces and scenes are in the middle, middle. meaning you, you probably have to just write a really detailed set of scene cards for this before you can actually communicate some of these things, because you just haven't forced yourself to figure out some of these answers yet. And to, to write a series of cards would actually force you to, to say, okay, I need to write down what is the scene here, I need to fill in what is this next scene here, you're not going to be able to have any gaps. It's going to kind of require you to flesh out some of these ideas where you're like, I don't know, there's a scene where he's flirting with the actress. Okay, what is that scene? And then how does that lead logically into the next scene? And you're just going to have to like put some things on paper, I think, to figure out the major beats of this because until you do that, you're not going to have to mentally do You're not going to have to, until you force yourself to, it might be difficult to actually figure out what some of those answers are, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, um, I think... Um, I think you. I think what I'm sort of struggling with is it's like I don't even necessarily think by the time it gets to those premise scenes that I will have a hard time writing it. I think what I'm struggling with is the reason why I haven't gotten to that is that I think I'm having a hard time just making justifiable around like the trying to locks break into two section. Um, I'm not sure essentially what it is, what choice it is he makes outside of I'm going to go on this journey. Now, obviously, it seems like he needs to team up with this actress but again it's like what's the like, I'm trying to remember like a, like a clear cut example of this it's more like the, there's a midpoint in like Moana where they like literally shake hands saying this is what we're going to do like it's the spoken bond in some sense between these two characters I know what the unspoken bond is right I know what he decides to do I know what she decides to do I want to make it as I said that neither of them are admitting that to one another so the point is meant to be that they would pre be pretending to do something else in the face of it. I don't have a good idea of what the, f what that sort of, that, that lie is that they're telling each other and they're bonding over. It's like, well, I don't want to tell you I'm looking for this painting because I don't want anyone to know. I don't want, and the girl's saying, I don't want you to know that I'm really just using you to make my boyfriend jealous. It's like, 
this. They don't want to say this to each other, but they need to say we're going to hang out for this amount of time to actually justify that happening. And I know I can just make it that they coincidentally keep bumping into each other because they take the same train, but I'm sure you could agree that like that doesn't feel as like informative or as as meaningful as them actually willingly deciding to do something together. And I just can't think of like what a good quote unquote lie or act that they would agree upon would be um, that <laughs> coexists with um, the process of him trying to find this painting. Now I know that's something I'm obviously going to have to figure out, but I guess I just wanted to admit to that to make it clear that I think that's what's struggling with and if you had any ideas i know it's a bit general but yeah i mean the floor is open <laughs> i'm not gonna expect you to have any ideas but yeah if you do i'd be curious uh sorry yeah, maybe anyone in the chat who is um maybe a little more familiar with hearing bits of the story before we'll have some suggestions for you um i don't have any answers for you at the moment and um i think that at least knowing where that point is, is that you'll need to work a little more on before you can nail down the rest of it and before the rest of it starts to fall into place. That is good to know. Like it's it's good to zero in and say this is the knot that I'm trying to untangle. And then once that knot is untangled, hopefully then it will start to untangle any other ones that you have going on as well. So um we maybe um in I just don't think I can solve the story issues at, at the moment, but hopefully at least this, this has gotten your gears turning and maybe just giving you some... Like, yeah, man, that's some, fine. Some I knew it was a long it. shot. <laughs> that's all good. Yeah, I knew, it was a, I knew it was a long shot, man, so don't worry about it. Sure, sure. I hope that maybe just talking it through a little bit is always useful to um, just start to see where the weak points are see what needs to change, <laughs> and like more than anything, I think that like although you're trying to solve this problem of what, what is the character motivation? motivation? What are they actually doing? The people hearing a pitch are listening to this idea of what's fun about this. Why would I want to see this? Why would people pay money for this? So I think that's yeah, two, sure. it's two separate uh, pro like problems to have, I guess, or two separate things that are two separate aspects of communicating a story idea. Or one, the first thing is, first of all, you have to make it all make sense to you, and it has to be interesting to you, and you have to want to write it and finish it. And then, and then once, once all that's done, done, then you have, have to be able to, at least in, in the pitch, set, like make it really clear why it's going to be amusing, amusing and entertaining and why people would wait in line and pay money and, and, on, and go out of their way to, to watch an experience like this. So that might be just two separate things to think about or balance. Like even once you have those, all those things figured out, all the like specifics of the, you know, the, the Rubik's Cube of your character motivations and things like that figured out, then you might have to pull back a little bit from that and just reorient on what's fun about this because the audience that's listening is going to care more about that than they are about the the intricacies of the the, the, the dynamics or, or things of that nature um so i'm um, not sure if that helps at this point but maybe that's just like another another thing to think about is just i think following the fun might just help you find the answers that you're looking for if that makes sense like if you think you're right if you focus on just what will be fun to watch and then ask yourself what choices do I have, do I have to, to make in terms, terms of character, character motivation, motivation to, to get, get to those cool, fun scenes, scenes. then that, that might just help start getting mm. getting certain gears unclogged and, and helping you make the choices that you need to build a really entertaining movie. Yeah, no, I'll try to, uh, I'll try to orientate my framework to that, so, or my frame of mind to that, so thank you. Sure, sure. sure. Thanks, Thanks for, um, uh, Pitch, for pitching in and, and for um, talking through your idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not a pitch, but, th but, but at least working out problems on the idea, always useful to do. So we're glad to have it. Yeah, thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Sure, sure. Um, and not to in the chat has a suggestion, maybe try writing an opening five or ten pages as opposed to feedback. Maybe that could work. Some people like to do that. Um, okay, we're to our last um, few minutes. Hopefully this pitching class was helpful for you guys and just in, um, emphasizing the important things and how we sell our ideas, whether or not we're selling them actually for money or we're trying to sell them in terms of make somebody else understand this, understand why they would want to tune into this and understand just moreover, what is fun about this? Um, you know, why is this worth my time? Is the question that people are always wondering why we have to get right to the point, cut all the excess fluff and fat away and just, you know, with laser-like precision, communicate the story within our time frame and leave them feeling like I just had a mini version of that experience, and the experience of the real thing would be exponentially better. All right, a reminder of every class we have coming up, free class on Friday the 20th at 11 a.m. That's going to be best protagonist for your story. 
we then have subplots on January 25th, that's Wednesday at 6, and we have the intro for our new feature class, Write a Movie in 8 Weeks, that's February 17th at 6, Write a Pilot in 6 Weeks, new free intro class for that starts March 5th at 11, and you can check back in WordCamp every Saturday at noon for the next 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 weeks for a free novel writing class um, every single weekend. All right, any last questions uh, or thoughts before we wrap up for today? I'm Kanye Wenders. You're Kanye Wenders. I don't know what that means or what the, what that is, but it seems to be some kind of very good joke, so well done. <laughs> any other? Not. It's not, not a good joke. joke. Okay, okay, bad joke. Anyone else? Last thoughts for today? On pitching or anything else we've discussed? If not, then we will wrap up. I mean, it's not necessarily on pitching, but maybe like stakes question, if I could. Sure. Just wondering if there's any. I know I've gone, we've gone over this probably a thousand times, but like, is there any more? Is there any specific like uh, questions that you would suggest asking yourself, or your, I guess, th or through your characters or to your characters, in terms of um. Sorry, I'm distracted by the stupid gift. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, just to ask your characters in terms of like trying to figure out the uh, the stakes of their decisions. The stakes. Sense. Okay, sure. So um, the first thing is that for a lot of characters, I'm not going to say most, but a lot of characters, their goal is to keep everything exactly how it is. Because you should understand that people, like, as students, as writers, we are students of human nature, and most people get very comfortable in certain patterns and lifestyles, right? So a lot of people just want to keep things exactly how they are and they'd be totally fine. And that can mean a, a lot of different things in terms of a story. It could mean that like I want to stay in my shell and I don't want to reach out of it because I'm safe here. It could be that um, like I am an aspiring soldier, but um, I'm not sure if I'm knight material. Like, uh, you know, the, maybe your character um, aspires to sort of stay in their lane or they aspire to have things not change. That's a really good point to start most characters at, and then the efforts that they're making in the try and lock sequence are going to come down to how do I pr pr stop from going on this journey, or how do I otherwise, like, um, how do I keep things how they were as much as I can? And that's just, like, a nice starting point for a lot of people when you just realize most people don't want adventure. Most people, like, stories are, suffer stories are about suffering. And most, most people don't typically want to be suffering. They don't want to go out on a difficult, dangerous quest with high stakes because that's dangerous and scary. So um, if you give, if you focus on giving your characters a relatable and simple goal, like I need to stay in my lane, I need to you know continue living my life, that just pr provides a really easy starting point. Um, and if you have characters that have a really clear thing that they want, like a, you have a character more than anything, they want to be the champion kickboxer in, in all the world. That can be a nice other starting point. So you have two, sort of two options. One, your character wants to stay in their life. And two, we have a character that desperately wants to leave their life. Those are kind of my starting points um, for features, at least for the most part, because these are going to be stories about your character and the most important events of their life, or the biggest, most impactful events of their life. And those are usually going to revol revolve around my life is great or great enough and I want it to never change or I need it to change and it absolutely has to. So I'd start at one of those two points for the most part. Yeah, right. Like I like like visualizing that as like the difference between like Pixar and Disney in some sense. It's like I want more versus like I don't want anything to change. Um I yeah, I get that. Like and I love the idea like an inciting incident can act as like the best or worst thing ever, but um I think I think what I what's difficult in in my head is that I think the idea that I just want things to remain the same, um, it, I think it lacks a set of like understanding of what the character's expectations are with that. I think part of my problem with what I'm doing is like um, I don't think my I don't know. It's almost like there. I, I was listening to Michael Owen, so I might use a lot of his terminology momentarily, but it's like. He's in a place where, like, he's in a stasis, but there are storm clouds in some sense on the horizon. And he's aware of that, so he's he desperately doesn't want that thing to happen. Obviously, something even worse happens, and it throws him into shambles. But I think the point is that, like, listening to him break down his process to Toy Story 3, he had a very clear 
to make that inciting incident work, you needed to make it very clear that the characters had a very clear expectation of what was going to happen in the future. So he changed it to like make it that they thought they were all going into the um, they were all going to be going up into the attic, and instead they all accidentally got thrown out, and that completely goes boom, like worst thing ever to them. I don't know what it is like for that. That's something they're expecting some sort of malady, right? But it is in the face of some form of change. So they're embracing some change that's about to occur. I just don't know what I can do. It doesn't feel like there's enough weight there to just be like, oh, if currently I'm just working as a security artist at an art gallery and I like this painting and it brings me a sense of comfort because it reminds me of the past. Well, that thing goes missing and because I care about it so much, obviously it and to my responsibility it was to take care of this thing like there's a lot of social pressure for me to figure out what the fuck happened sure i have every reason to try to figure that thing out but i think in order for that to be really jarring right it needs to be in some sense that he can't exist or function without that thing and i feel like the only thing that i've got is like if the painting goes missing for example the only thing i have is some form of external stakes internally it's like sure it goes missing we get it but like Really, outside of those internal stakes, nothing in his world has changed except for the fact that he's going to get in trouble for this. But the problem is if I make it that he just immediately loses his job, him functioning within the system of that gallery for the rest of the story doesn't really take place in the same manner or can't logistically make sense. And so you kind of have to make it that he doesn't get fired. And the problem with that is that now that removes one of the biggest in external stakes that could be present for the story and so I don't really know what to do in the face of that so I know that was a bit like, all over the place but like is there anything that you can think of that might be like alongside of that I know like Michael Hunt talks about internal external and philosophical stakes but I don't know if there's anything else any other type of thing or technique that could be there for me to really ram up that moment because it doesn't seem like it's impacting him enough at this point in order to really justify him taking action. Does that make well, sense? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you've, you've chosen, chosen something very abstract and unusual right. and non-relatable for the average person. And and because right. you've chosen a very difficult set of starting circumstances, the hoops that you have to <laughs> jump through to make that work, I mean, it becomes a challenge, definitely. Um, I mean, it, if, we, if, if, if it makes your character suffer to lose that thing, then we need to see your character suffer. It's, it's as simple as that. Like, we need to, if, if his confidence was dependent on this thing, then we need to see that his confidence is now broken and shattered and he's not able to do something he was able to do before. Or I think you just need to just kind of zero in on how does it make him actually suffer that this thing is gone? Like, if, if he never found it again, what would happen? Would he start losing his mind? Would he start punching through walls? Would he... Like, like what, what what would actually occur? Like what's, what's the, the worst, worst that would happen? I think that we need to know that even right. if it's something that like we would never happen to us because very few people would get this attached to a painting at their job. Then no, that's a good point. We just need to see specifically how he would suffer as a result of it being gone. And if that is acute enough and strong enough, then we will root for him trying to fix that problem. That's a great point. So like specify the consequences. I hadn't thought of it that way. I don't know why I hadn't fucking thought of it that way. It's so and simple. Okay, yeah, I'll think of that. Thank you. Okay, Cheers. sure. Hope that's helpful. We're past our time, so we have to um, call for today, but hopefully that there's been some good stuff in this pitching class for you guys. And if nothing else, just take this with you. You should just practice your pitch for 10 to 15 minutes beforehand just to try to work out those major points. Make sure you're able to communicate it within the time frame efficiently and cutting right to the most important stuff, and that we're not spending way too long on the opening scenes or those first couple moments that are set up. And then we're not spending, you know, we're, we're making sure that we spend the majority of time of our pitch in, you know, of our verbal pitch in the most substantial part of the story, which is the second act. And that we are spending a lot of work emphasizing what is fun and interesting in that second act. Okay, that's what we're going to finish today. We hope to see you guys at an upcoming class like the one on Friday at 11. Um, or if you are in the uh, boot camp later that day, that will be at 6. So we hope to see you guys soon at your next script camp class or event. Have a great rest of your night.